graduate, began his career as a biologist in North Central Oklahoma in 1992. He was responsible for the management of 25,000 acres of wildlife management area and provided technical assistance to private landowners in the Creek, Pawnee, Payne, and Osage counties. Since 2011, Jeff has been a Central Regional Wildlife Supervisor and oversees the management of 16 WMAs and private land wildlife issues in 27 counties. So let's help me welcome Jeff Bennington. Thank you very much, and it's an honor to come and talk to you today about three things that I'm real passionate about, and uh, that's wildlife, the use of prescribed fire, and the uh, Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, my employer. Um, and I've always wanted to come up. I've never been up here on the north side of the Flint Hills, so it's uh, awesome to be able to come up and, and just experience it driving, and I look forward very much to the uh, field trip tomorrow. Like I said, throughout my career, we've done prescribed fire in the department. So we're going to talk to you about basically about the department's prescribed burning program and maybe some lessons that uh, you can learn from our experiences. But um, before I get to talking about what we do on our public lands, I'm going to talk about what we do on our private lands real briefly. Um, we provide technical assistance to private landowners throughout the state you know, we'll help write burn plans. We'll, we've actually got some little cost share programs that can assist landowners with constructing fire breaks. But we recognize in the department that the prescribed burn associations are what's going to make it happen in, on the ground in private land in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's vast majority is, is public, I mean, privately owned land. So that's, that's where it's got to happen. And we see the PBAs. We really are excited and think that uh, just on the cusp of getting a lot of acreage on the ground. Um, as far as the department doing active burns, we burn on our wildlife management areas. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but um, we started a burning programs in the 1980s. Before the 1980s, like a lot of uh, the United States, people were opposed to the use of fire, including our biologists, you know, and, and over time, those guys, the older guys retired. That was just a, a different way of thinking, and it was absolutely the wrong way of thinking. But um, we put a lot of emphasis on burning now. In an average year on our wildlife management areas, now there's never such a thing as an average year. If you burn, you know there's no such thing as an average year. The conditions are, are uh, drastically different each year, but in an average year, we're going to burn 100,000 acres now scattered throughout the state. We're still kind of in the dormant season rut, kind of like how the biologists of the 80s were kind of stagnant on burning at all. Our biologists today are more in that dormant season period is when they're comfortable doing burns. That's what we've done for 35 years, so that's what uh, uh, resistant to change. Some of that's dictated by the fact that these are public use areas, and during peak hunting season, there's going to be people out there, and you just can't um, you can't be burning during peak turkey season, for instance. You're not going to be able to uh, run the risk of burning somebody up. So uh, we have some limitations, but most of our burning is going to be done mid-January mid through mid-March. Why do we burn? We burn for the same reasons that everybody else does. It's essential for e ecosystem function, creates some great wildlife habitat, and, and we operate on a shoestring budget. So money is important and you can make a lot of bang for your buck when you're using prescribed fire. Uh, this satellite imagery is from the Forest Service. Um, cuts, it cuts the panhandle off of Oklahoma, but uh, the rest of Oklahoma is here. You get a little bit of Arkansas, a little bit of Texas. Um, the yellow area is what's burned in the state of Oklahoma since January 1 of this year. Um, and this is a pretty representative sample and it could be wildfire or it could be prescribed fire you know it doesn't it doesn't discriminate but on that but uh, so you you'll have one big like that was the big Woods County wildfire that went up into Kansas as well but you can see in the in the Osage Hills have a lot of fire use outside of that it's patchy you know you'll have some areas uh, this is largely cross timber type area right in here um, this is Arbuckle Mountains that you see on I-35 starting to be more burning activity in there, which is a good thing. And you, a lot of these other yellow patches that you see on here 
will be uh, department fires. Uh, but, but, but more and more, if we, if we took this same slide 10 years ago, which it wasn't available at that time, but there would be less yellow on the landscape. I think our prescribed burn associations and just a, a better fire culture and better educated public is helping get a little more of the state yellow. And also keep in mind that you got a lot of your western Oklahoma here is uh, heavily agriculture, you know, wheat fields and stuff. You're not going to get those to burn. So um, that's kind of the where we're at in Oklahoma. In terms of where we are with the wildlife department and how we're burning, this slide will show the, the three-year average acres burned specifically to each WMA. So a WMA that uses more acres of fire will be red in color. Um, if it has no fire the past three years, it'll be black. And uh, in, in between, your oranges and yellows are going to be um, going to use fire quite a bit. It is somewhat misleading because some of your smaller WMAs like uh, Grady County WMA, for instance, has a real aggressive burning program, but the WMA is only 1,200 acres. So it's not ever going to be more than green in this picture. But in general, you can see our guys in southeast Oklahoma are very aggressive with fire. That They make up about, on average, they're going to make up about 70% of our acres burned. That's also where most of the public land is. You know, all of the public land shows up on this map, one of these colors. So uh, you can see we, there's a, there's a, our guys have a lot more emphasis on it down here, but there's also a lot more land down there. I'm going to kind of go through some individual WMAs and talk about the burning programs at each one. And if you're going to talk about burning program with the wildlife department and, and on the WMAs, you've got to talk about Push Mataha WMA. This is, this is a Great Plains fire item, but uh, Push Mataha is going to be pine timber. Um, southeast Oklahoma, heavy rainfall, but they, they use fire a great deal at that place. And if you haven't read up on it, it's, it's got these research plots that were developed in 1982. And there's 36 different treatments there. They went in there and on most of the plots, they harvested the timber to a certain level and then started a fire regime, either a control that received zero, that received no fire, or a one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year burn cycling uh, fire frequency after that. And basically, the take-home message from, from the test plots is that three years is about where the forest and the grasslands at that location, they're going to kind of meet together. You've got a lot of diversity between forest and grasslands. If your fire interval is lower, if it's two years or one year, big blue stem dominates on those mountains down there. Um, if your fire frequency is four years or five years, your forest will be dominant. It will be better than if you didn't burn at all, but in terms of wildlife habitat, but your, your forest will dominate out, dominate the grass. And those are moderate intensity burns. We do have a, on our Outdoor Oklahoma, there's a, a really good article on that if you want to watch all your YouTube. You can hit me up later if you want to get that link. Uh, Altmogee Wildlife Management Area, this is just south of Tulsa if you're familiar with the Oklahoma geography. Uh, this is interesting in that the test plots are more on a landscape level. Uh, Bruce Burton was a biologist at this location and he started the burning program there in 1989. And there's, in this main core of the WMA here, he developed eight different burn plots. And he's maintained the burn interval on those plots since 1989. There's a one, one plot that is a control plot. Uh, there's one unit that has uh, five fires per decade, one unit that has one fire per decade, and multiple units with either two or three fires per decade. And this is, uh, I, I skipped out and said these are, these are rugged sandstone hills, and the majority of the WMA is rugged sandstone hills that has generally considered to have the oldest or the largest stand of ancient cross timbers anywhere. So it's kind of a unique place. If you ever get a chance to go and look at it, you can, as you drive down the road, you can obviously, the, the areas that have the higher fire frequency jump out at you. Um, 
most of our WMAs are going to be different. They're going to be achieving, they're going to be geared towards a, a two-year fire interval or a three-year fire interval or, or something like that. Old Mulgee's the only one that I'm aware of on the landscape level where your test plots are basically four and five hundred acre treatment areas. I think there's a lot of opportunity long term for some wildlife research on Alt Mulgee just because of, the, of that fact that the, to see what habitats the wildlife selects on, based on fire interval. Uh, Cross Timbers WMA is a newer WMA that we purchased down along the Red River and it was a historically Cross Timbers habitat as well. The prior landowner treated most of that or at least good portions of that cross timbers habitat. So you've got a patchwork of, of forest, you've got some oak savanna, you've got uh, some, some native grasslands. Um, the landowner had done a lot of good things, but he was not able, like a lot of Oklahomans, he was, he was, on, the, he was on the cutting edge of being burning when nobody else was burning, but he didn't have the capacity to really do it to the level that he needed to to control the woody vegetation. So when we purchased the property, the woody vegetation was in uh, taking over a lot of the grassland type habitats. We initiated a, a, a burning program there in 2012, and this map kind of depicts what we've done there with our 17 different burn units. The reds, the reds have been burned three times since 2012, the blues have been burned twice, and the blacks have been burned once, but this, this section over here, we've only had it a year and a half, so we burned some of it twice in a year and a half. We, we wanted to go in there with intense fire and on a, on a high frequency to start with to get our woody vegetation back up under control. And I, one thing I did not mention yet on cross timbers, it's sandy soil. And for wildlife use, burning is always, most always, going to be have positive wildlife habitat benefits but when you do it on sandy soil it's excellent it goes from being good to excellent you just get a tremendous plant response in these sandy soils for uh, plant structure and the species uh, that produce food um, so Shelley talked about it earlier the patch burning and grazing we're doing that on cross timbers WMA we're doing it a little different in that our patch burning is on a two-year rotation now. After we get the woody vegetation back under control, we are probably going to revert back to a three-year burn rotation. But we're not there yet. It, uh, it, the things she was talking about, we've been, we've been seeing the outstanding results of it. Each one of these four burn units is going to have three or four different burn units in, inside of each one of the grazing cells. So those cows will park out on the burned area, leave the one-year-old burn stuff alone, and you get a tremendous amount of diversity. Um, this particular picture was this year. It was this year's burn in February. The cattle parked out in there. Tremendous uh, response from western ragweed, obviously. And, but there's a lot of other Forbes mixed in with this, and this was right after the cattle were taken out, so uh, the cover, you get a little more cover by the time frost comes, so, but the other patches in there will have more of a taller forb community mixed in with grasses. With us doing the two-year rotation versus the three-year rotation, those grasses don't have as long to recover as they would in a three-year rotation, so um, with us a primary target of ours is Bob White quail. We, there's enough grassland out there for, for nesting in that one year old, one year since burned. Uh, it might be a little better for nesting if we had that two years since burned, but right now our biggest concern is for the long term threat for quail is we're not controlling our woody vegetation big uh, enough. So once we get that under control, we'll, we'll go to more of a three year, but the two year, that uh, it works. It works very well with the, with the grazing and a, and a two year rotation. It's working well for us anyway. Last WMA that I'm going to talk about, and this is kind of where it gets into the private landowner relations, is uh, Lexington Wildlife Management Area. And it's, Lexington's located, all of that gray area that you see up here, tan area is the Oklahoma City Metro, okay? And we've got 9,500 acres right on the south end of that. Okay, 
If you've burned around people before, you know it's a challenge. It's a lot easier for us to burn at Cross Timbers WMA down there on the Red River, and especially if the wind's out of the north, because I'll... If somebody complains about the smoke and it gets over on the other side of the river, I tell them, hey, call your senator, call your representative. And, and, uh, but we don't, we don't take that same approach at Lexington. It's a little different up there, you know. We don't want them calling their senator and representative up there. But uh, we can have the Texans, they can call theirs anytime they want. But it's, uh, as you can see, uh, south wind's a common wind that you want to burn with, especially if you want to get intense fire. You want to have a south component to your wind, generally speaking, because it's, you're going to have warmer ambient air temperatures that's going to be able to feed that head fire that you need to control brush. Um, what do we have if we have a south wind? Where are we going to be pushing smoke? Oklahoma City and Norman, Midwest City, bad news. Because sometimes, more so in this cross timbers type environment than in true grassland, you're going to have your grassland patches are going to burn, but uh, in these larger units, you, topography, you know, backfires are going to creep down into those uh, lowland areas and you're going to have snags that smolder all night. Somewhere that smoke is going to park for the night, you know, in most instances. So we, we are limited on our transport winds. We've got to have something on the compass dial with a northwest, sometimes a southwest, depending on the smoke dispersion conditions. And uh, the metro's coming more and more our way. Kind of, a lot of people are happy with uh, the department's burn program there at Lexington, but we do have, we do have some people that sometimes get disgruntled. This is a, a message that was on our answering machine here a few, oh, about five years ago while we were conducting a control burn. Now, if you're offended by a bad word, you might want to go like this, but this was one of the ladies there in the neighborhood, very classy lady. If I can get it to go. She didn't want her stuff burning up, evidently. So you've got, you can't make everybody happy. And that's with us, with us trying to get along well with landowners. You're still going to have some people out there that are not happy with your burning program. And the more people you have around, the more of a concern that is for you. At Lexington, for us, like I said, you've got 9,500 acres in here. This is a, a burn program that's been on this place for 31 years. So it, we've been, at the start, uh, let me back up and say, it's pretty poor soil. Most of this is clay soil, cross timbers type stuff, but it's about 40% tall grass prairie, about 50% cross timber, and about 10% miscellaneous old field or, and stuff like that. It was actually an old, you wouldn't think of central Oklahoma as the prime location for a naval gunnery range, but Lexington was. Uh, during World War II, a naval gunnery range, at least this eastern, por uh, western portion of it. So uh, we got the big chunk of it, and this is a state prison here. One good thing, we can send smoke to the prisoners. They can't really gripe. They can gripe about as much as the Texans can. It's not going to do them any good. But, you know, the, we do have about a mile buffer with the prison there to help us with smoke dispersion conditions with the north wind. So that's kind of what we're dealing with at Lexington. Uh, initially, you're in an area that fire culture was non-existent when we started the burning program there at Lexington. You know, because it was already on the outskirts. You know, ta uh, the urban area is coming out to it even more so now. But even 31 years ago, nobody was burning in this area. Nobody. So the only fire those people had experienced was wildfire, which were all, of course, bad experiences. Now. Um, so you had a, a lot of people that were concerned about the fear. All of a sudden there's these huge smoke clouds. Um, somewhere those smoke clouds are going to park out overnight. So due to the numerous, we, we received a lot of complaints. Like, some were like the lady that you heard on the tape. Some were uh, more civil. But we, we did receive a lot of complaints. Due to that, our fire windows were tightened. And, and you think to yourself, well, as long as you maintain your fire within your boundaries, why do you care, Jeff? You know, well, you, whether you're an agency or whether you're a prescribed burn association, you should really 
I'm not saying that you're never going to make everybody happy, but you should try to make your neighbors where they're not upset. You know, treat them like you'd want to be treated, and uh, treat them, even, even the lady there that was upset about her stuff pot uh, potentially burning up. You know, you maintain a professional relationship. Why is that important? Ask Texas Parks and Wildlife what can happen if enough people or the right people get upset about you and your burning program. And they go to talk to their senators and representatives. You can get legislated into a corner if we, if, if we act in a, inappropriately and enough people or the right people get upset. So that's on Lexington. We, we try to accommodate people. We try to communicate and uh, we try to, we're going to burn, and we tell them we're going to burn, but we're, we'll try to do things to make that, uh, and one thing that we do on the public, and the public now realizes this, is that it's, it's helping reduce fuel loads in case there's a wildfire that comes through. Lexington WMA now has very, very little cedar on it, where 31 years ago it had a lot, and it would have a tremendous amount today if not for the burning program that's in place. One thing that we've studied in the department, and we've studied this pretty extensively, is, is it, there's a, a Rolaids inverse correlation, is what we call it. And it has to do with certain factors that are associated with burning. And we, we started noticing this inverse correlation with fire breaks. You know, if, if you've got narrow fire breaks, you know, I've known some guys in the department, they'll say, when you see that red ant trail right there, I'm going to burn off that red ant trail. And they will. They'll try to burn off that red ant trail. But you know what? When they've got that little bitty ant trail, they're going to need this, the bottle of Rolaids. It's stressful. And not only is it stressful to you, in this picture of Lexington, this is the WMA here, these are all these houses across the way. If you're burning off of an ant trail, what do you think these people in these houses are thinking? That's what they're getting. You know, they're, they're needing the king size, family size container of Rolaids. So if you've got a wide fire guard, not only is it making you have one Rolaid, it's making, more importantly, it's making all these people have one Rolaid. They see, and the same thing, we found this same correlation occurred with, be it with equipment infrastructure or whether it's with personnel. If you bring enough people with an, enough equipment and you've got good fire breaks, your number of Rolaids is going to go down and more importantly, those people across the fence that are so worried, their number of Rolaids is going to go down. You're going to get less phone calls to Oklahoma City. That's, that's the reverse correlation that we've discovered. And this is just an example. We know it's not practical for everybody to have a 75-foot fire guard, nor is it needed in many instances, especially if you don't have woody cover. Those woody vegetation is where your problem with most fires occur, not in the grassland. The grassland you could burn off of a two-foot path, especially if you've got a mower there beside it. But in these instances where we have timber, and where we know we're going to have a burning program from here on, we've invested in the infrastructure at Lexington to, to help us do these burns easier and talk about problems that we had in the past before we made these investments in the infrastructure. We were shooting for a three-year burn interval on our vegetation there. That's what we think is the best overall for combination wildlife on Lexington. But through 2011, that's what our actual interval was. We actually had nine years where we did not strike a match. You know, and you try to play catch up the other years, but you never play catch, you never get caught up. All these other areas that we're talking about, we burn a lot in the wildlife department and you've got prioritized areas, but you're, you can take every good burn day that you have in your window and still not get it done. So it's hard to play, it's hard to play catch up. Um, but these changes that we made to our infrastructure, widening those fire guards, we've gotten better equipment now, and we, and we group up more. That's been our tendency now is to, instead of doing maybe one burn unit at three places, we'll come to one place and burn three or four or maybe even five units on the same WMA that day. And the wider fire guards let you, let you get that done a lot easier than if you have to sit and, and babysit every little bitty stretch. So uh, that's kind of, with, with our improvements, we're, 
we're sitting at 4.9 now for the for the 31 year program and this this is kind of what we're looking like on Lexington right now these actually are test plots for growing season burns in cross timbers vegetation here so these bur these burn they just don't burn on a regular basis this is how most of your WMAs are set up they're they're targeting a certain interval and they'll have a patchwork of those individual burn units uh, it would be better for wildlife like Dwayne was talking there if, if for, for diversity's sake, but to, to make these burn units smaller. But in reality, you've got to balance getting the fire. If you break them up too much, our interval might not be 4.9. It might be six-year interval because you can't get to them all. So that's kind of how we do things in the wildlife department. Like I said, nothing ever goes wrong on our fires. And we noticed here on this Blue River last year that keep out sign burn up and <laughs> corner post burn up and we saw some kids out there with their little smartphones taking pictures of it and we thought well looks like we're getting ready to be on Facebook <laughs> anyway that's that's the department's burning program if you've got any questions about the burning program I mean if, if we have time now or we can wait until later I'll be here all for the rest of this thing we got time we got any questions we do our rainfall it, it varies tremendously in the state of Oklahoma from 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 the west out there um, south southeast Oklahoma in the central region it's going to be somewhere around 30 to 35 inches um, push Mataha it's going to be 40 to 45 you know so um, on on our seasons of burning this was the first year that we'd done a significant amount of summer burning at, at Lexington we and, and we're kind of using it as a backup plan we'd like it'd be in an ideal world we'd have summer burns but what we are doing now is these years that we would have missed fire in the past we're using the, the, the growing season burn as a backup plan you know if we if we miss our dormant season burn we're gonna come in there with the growing season burn and that's so far it, uh, we haven't had the last few years when we've been planning that and had that as the backup plan we haven't needed it because we've gotten most of our burns done in the regular season but that's a good question lexington is ungraced and that's not an easy decision i, mean, I think it, it needs cows you it hasn't had cows since the 1940s so getting all those old fences and stuff back in place i have to bust out this wallet and uh, the, we don't have a lot of money. And, and the other thing, that area being on the, in the Oklahoma City Metro, it gets a tremendous amount of off-season use, more so than any other WMA that we have. Horseback riders, just campers, backpackers. So all of the fences and stuff involved would be an undertaking. And, and uh, but it, it does need it. And we've considered it. But Lexington doesn't have, only one that had grazing of those that I mentioned was cross timbers. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the terminology moderate temperature burn and then burning intensity. Is that predicted by your description, or what do you mean by that? Well, yeah, basically, we'll target days that are going to give a more intense fire. Um, how we conduct it in the central region, you know, like I said, that's 28 counties with those WMAs, and it all have a, a list uh, northwest wind with, with uh, moderate conditions we're going to go here northwest wind with moderately heavy conditions we're going to burn up we're going to burn at cross timbers um, northwest wind with with just moderate conditions we might burn at old mulgee and then then you factor things in like when has it rained at these different places and everything but yeah the prescriptions will dictate the intensity of the fire and it doesn't sometimes it everybody knows it's been out burning sometimes it does more than what you think sometimes it's less intense than what you think any other questions? All right, Jeff, appreciate it. Let's give him a round of applause.